Ready? Yes, thank you. Okay. okay, our next speaker is uh, George Staffiu. George is the director of the Cable Institute for Cosmology at the University of Cambridge. He's one of the leaders of the Planck collaboration, and he has also received numerous awards and honors during his career. He has made several key contributions to the study of the CMB in the cosmic structure formation, and today he will tell us about the Hubble tension. Thank you, George, and you have the floor. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Well, the uh, um, I think most of you will have heard about the Hubble tension because it's become a, uh, a very controversial topic in cosmology. And almost, uh, you know, on a daily basis, you'll see papers on astro-PH with, you know, uh, you know, fanciful solutions to the Hubble tension. So what I want to talk about today, I've got my talk done in two parts. Um, the first part is on uh, the cosmic microwave background. How reliable is the cosmic microwave background uh, measurement of, uh, of the Hubble constant? And then uh, looking at the uh, distance ladder uh, measurements of the Hubble constant. So, you know, for, for this audience, I think the first part of the talk will be more familiar material, and the second part will be going into classical astronomy. So I've tried to keep it light. Okay, so. Um, so it's a hot topic. This is a figure from a, an article from Scientific American. Um, and it shows um, measurements of the Hubble constant as a function of time. So these purple points here uh, are using the traditional distance ladder, you know, very, very similar to Hubble's original uh, measurements um, uh, of the Hubble constant using Cepheid variables. So this uh, measurement here was the Hubble Space Telescope key project, uh, Cepheid analysis. Um, and then these measurements have been refined over the years, uh, particularly by Adam Rees and uh, his group. Um, and they get a, a value of 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, now, if you assume the basic six parameter uh, Lambda CDM cosmology, which I'll refer to as the base Lambda CDM model. So that, that base model, you can then use uh, the cosmic microwave background and isotropy measurements of the power spectrum temperature fluctuations to uh, determine the value of the Hubble constant. And so this has been done by uh, you know, ground-based and WMAP experiment and the WMAP uh, satellite. And then you can see this step in 2013, which is when we published the first results from, from Planck. And that value has stayed stable. The error bar has gone down, as I'll explain in a moment. Um, and we get a value of 67 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. So the Hubble tension is the difference between the CMB value, assuming the base six parameter lambda CDM cosmology and these distance ladder measurements. And um, it's uh, around, uh, as we'll see, it's uh, around a 4.3 sigma uh, effect. Uh, so that's led to a lot of speculation that maybe the cosmology is wrong, okay? Um, so, uh, um, you know, so it's important. Now, um, th there are other ways of, of uh, measuring uh, the uh, Hubble constant. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this method shown by these sort of pink points here, which is based on looking at the color magnitude diagrams of, uh, of stars in nearby objects. Um, and uh, you look for the ridge line from red giant branch stars in the color magnitude diagram. And that technique has been uh, um, most extensively investigated by uh, Wendy Friedman and her group uh, based in Chicago. Um, and they published a value uh, last year of 70 plus or minus, you know, uh, a couple of, of kilometers per second per megaparsec. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so this is, again, it's, you know, a, a variant of the traditional distance ladder. Um, and uh, most people, have uh, interpreted that measurement 
as being inconclusive in the sense that it's compared. I mean, even the authors of, uh, of that paper said that uh, the measurement was in between the Planck value and the Adam Rees Cepheid value. And so it was inconclusive. Uh, what I'll show you is actually that, that the tip of the red giant branch measurements are statistically incompatible with this, uh, with the Cepheid measurements. So there's a problem with the distance ladder measurements and that this value is compatible with, uh, with Planck. Okay, so here, here are some numbers uh, for the H0 tension. Um, so Adam Reese's value um, from the Shoes collaboration is 74 plus or minus 1.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, the uh, Planck value um, is 67.4 plus or minus 0.6. Um, and these are discrepant by 6.6 .6 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So it's a discrepancy at the 10% level for, for measurements which, you know, the ground based. Uh, distance ladder, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, Cepheid uh, distance scale measurement is supposedly accurate to two percent. Okay, so um, so the, you know it's not a small discrepancy given the errors on these various numbers. Okay, so uh, so this shows the uh, temperature power spectrum uh, of the anisotropies as measured by the Planck satellite. So these are the results that we pu published in 2013. And the red line is the best fitting six parameter base lambda CDM cosmology. And the residuals with respect to that best fit are shown below. So that's what we had in 2013. Uh, then, and this was based on half of, half of the data from Planck. Uh, so then, uh, two years later, we published the second data release, um, and that's the spectrum uh, that we got from the second data release. And you can see that, that actually, the, the, I mean, if you look carefully, the main difference is an overall amplitude shift of 2% in the power spectrum. And that's because uh, we were missing a little bit of uh, far field solid angle from the beams. Uh, in 2013, we hadn't modeled the far field uh, beams from Planck. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we were missing a little bit of solid angle and that changed the overall normalization. But apart from that, uh, the cosmology is identical and what you can see, almost identical. And you can see that the residuals with respect to the best fit cosmology uh, have gone down. So you improve the signal to noise and the residuals go down. Then we had a, a third data release uh, in 2018. And the main difference between the, the uh, 2015 data release and the 2018 data release uh, was um, the, uh, the, the focus on uh, accurate polarization measurements from Planck. Uh, and so the temperature results are hardly shifted. And that was the spectrum as we published in 2018. So very, very tiny shift associated with slight differences that we made to the model of foregrounds, okay. Um, now, uh, since then, uh, Stephen Grattan and I uh, spent a lot of time uh, trying to squeeze um, more signal to noise out of Planck. And we did that primarily by um, extending the sky coverage. So we used more sky uh, and you have to be quite careful in how you do this um, uh, because the, the, the dust emission uh, becomes stronger as you approach the galactic plane. Uh, so you have to be selective in the frequencies that you use, uh, but it's possible and we published a paper detailing all of this and why we think it's, it's reliable. Uh, so how did the spectrum change? Um, so th that's, that's what we get. So the base six parameter lambda CDM model, I mean, you know, the, the, the red line in the top showing you the best fit theory hardly changes. Uh, but what you can see is that the, um, the residuals are smaller. So it quietens up 
um, and becomes an even better fit to the base lambda CDM cosmology. So you see similar, similar things in polarization. Um, so I will show you in a little bit later on, I will show you the, um, the temperature E-mode uh, cross-spectrum, E-mode polarization cross-spectrum, so the TE spectrum, and I'll show you the EE spectrum um, from Planck and compare it with the new results from, from ACT. But in both temperature and polarization, uh, what happens is that you extend the sky coverage, the, um, the errors go down, so you make a more powerful likelihood, uh, the errors go down and you get even better fits to the basic six parameter lambda CDM model. Um, so there's no evidence from Planck that there is any additional physics other than uh, the six parameters, the physics assumed in the six parameter lambda CDM model. So you don't have to do a fancy statistical analysis to see this. Uh, these are the residuals from Planck 2018 compared to our new analysis uh, on an expanded plot. And you can see just how much quieter and consistent with the basic lambda CDM cosmology, um, uh, how much it is. And, and, and you know, the, the, there has been you know, some speculation in the literature about, you know, interpreting, you know, dips and wiggles and things um, in terms of features in the power spectrum and so on. There is nothing of any significance like that in the data. Okay, so, um, so here are the parameters, uh, some of the parameters from the six, from the six parameter base lambda CDM cosmology. Here is the Hubble constant. Here, shown as a function of the physical density in baryons, omega bh squared. Uh, so, you know, for, for our purposes in this talk, you can focus on this panel. Uh, these, uh, this nomenclature here is uh, our own internal Cambridge uh, naming of uh, these likelihoods. But this is basically the 2018 Planck uh, analysis. And whoops, and this is our new analysis. Okay. So if we focus on this panel showing the Hubble constant uh, as a function of physical baryon density, um, so note the following. Um, so the red contours are the constraints that you get from the temperature power spectrum. And the gray contours are the constraints that you get from the temperature E-mode polarization cross spectrum. So a different spectrum, okay? And then the blue is the combination of TT, TE, and EE, though the polarization, the pure polarization data from Planck uh, are not very constraining. So most of the power comes from these two, the combination of TT and TE spectra. But you see that, um, that the Hubble constant, you get a low value of the Hubble constant from the TE spectrum. When we go to our improved analysis, what you see is better consistency between TT and TE, that's because we made the, you know, both uh, the temperature and the polarization um, statistically more powerful by increasing the sky coverage. Um, and um, in fact, the, the error on the Hubble constant um, is slightly smaller from the TE spectrum, but you see that they're remarkably consistent. Different spectra give you consistent results. Um, and then the combination of uh, all of the data gives you the blue contours. Okay, so as you get similar things for the amplitude of the fluctuations for those of you who are interested in weak lensing. It's a very similar story uh, for the amplitude of the fluctuations that weak lensing is sensitive to. Um, so this result I think is not widely appreciated. Um, so I think, you know, focus on this panel uh, the green contours show you the constraints on the Hubble parameter if you just use multiples from 2 to 800. So that's the multiple range spanned by WMAP. Um, and um, if we cut Planck back to this multiple range, we get identical results to WMAP, which is the, are these green contours. Um, so now if we add in the polarization 
information from Planck, but only up to multiples of 800, you get the red contours. And the results from the full range of multiples for Planck are the blue contours. So this explains the jump, okay, the, the, uh, the, the jump um, from WMAP to Planck is just a statistical fluctuation. Um, but if WMAP had been able to measure polarization up to multiples of 800, they'd have got the same results um, as Planck uh, at, uh, over the full multiple range. So, so this effect, you know, the value of the Hubble constant is not some effect that's being driven by high multiples from, from Planck. You're basically, for the, for the six parameter lambda CDM cosmology, you have got the cosmological parameters if you have polarization by the time you've uh, extended to multiples of 800 or, or so. You don't need the full multiple range. And then things are very stable. So I think that result is not uh, widely appreciated. Now, in addition to the six parameter lambda CDM cosmology, uh, in the Planck papers, we, um, we ran an extensive grid of models adding in additional parameters. And so here are some results just abstracted from our grid of models. Um, so, so this just shows the value of, uh, of the Hubble constant. This is the base lambda CDM model. Then we add massive neutrinos. Then we add um, additional relativistic species, massive neutrinos and additional relativistic species, sterile neutrinos, then curvature for which CMB is not very constraining, uh, uh, but it becomes constrained if we add in baryon acoustic oscillations. Then dark energy uh, with a, uh, a constant equation of state parameter and the redshift dependent uh, uh, components as well. Uh, again, the CMB on its own is not very constraining, so you can't determine the Hubble parameter. Uh, but if you combine with uh, baron acoustic oscillations, you can constrain these models. Add in the supernova data and you can constrain, constrain them even better. Uh, and then allowing a run in the spectral index and so on. Now, the, the uh, point of showing you this is that in our grid of models, you can see that there is no hint. There's not even, you know, the slightest hint of movement towards a value as high as 73 or 74. It stays stable uh, at 67. And this is simply because um, the CMB data, and if you add in the barren acoustic oscillations, um, the, 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 the data does not want anything more than this basic lambda CDM six parameter model. Okay, so there's no hint of, of movement. So here are the polarization spectra. And so this is, so the blue symbols here, this is the TE spectrum, and then the residuals. Um, th the best fit from Planck is shown as the red curve for the base cosmology. And then these are uh, the measurements, the recent measurements from uh, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope from their data release for, which came out uh, just uh, about two months ago. Um, and you can see that they're in very good agreement. Now, ACT extends to high multiples, to multiples of about 4,200. Um, and the, the red line, this is not a fit to the ACT data. This is just a prediction from the best fit cosmology from Planck for what ACT should see. And here are the residuals shown here. So you can see that, again, you know, from from at ex having, extending the polarization measurements to high multiples, you see no evidence of any departure from the base lambda CDM cosmology. And quite a few of the explanations, uh, you know, if you fiddle around with the with recombination, or you do something like add interacting interactions in the neutrino sector, then um, you affect the damping tail. Of the fluctuations, and there's no hint of anything like that in the data. This is the EE spectrum, again uh, showing ACT going to high multiples, 
um, and it fits the uh, so the data fits the best fit Planck cosmology extremely well. So, so that's the first part of the, the talk. Um, so just to go through these points, uh, the CMB results for the base lambda CDM cosmology are totally secure. Okay, there, there is, um, it's as secure as anything I think uh, that we see um, you know, in science. Um, so in that cosmology, the Hubble constant must be low, and uh, there are many ways of, um, uh, it's not just a Planck-based result, uh, but there are many ways of, of, um, of uh, looking at, uh, independent ways of looking at that result. So I think it's totally secure. Uh, there's no evidence for any new physics from the CMB, okay? Um, and that conclusion has been strengthened by ACT and it's strengthened by our reanalysis of, of Planck. Now you can apply an inverse distance ladder uh, using supernovae and barren acoustic oscillation data. Um, and you can do this um, in a way that's independent of the nature of dark energy or dark matter and their interactions provided uh, that uh, uh, you assume a metric theory of gravity. And um, you get a low value of the Hubble constant um, of 68 plus or minus one. So there's no evidence for any new physics at late times. And then uh, very recently, uh, the Lunar Collaboration uh, published uh, experimental results on uh, the, this deuterium uh, helium-3 radiative capture cross-section, uh, which um, uh, has improved the consistency, substantially improved the consistency between Planck uh, Big Bang nuclear synthesis and the observed deuterium bonds. We were a little bit concerned about this when we wrote the 2018 Planck papers because there was a theoretical uh, calculation of this capture cross-section, which was slightly discrepant at around the two sigma level, but that's not co uh, compatible with uh, the lunar results, which are very, very accurate. Uh, so, um, so nuclear synthesis works to high accuracy um, and there's no evidence of any new physics at early times. So, so if we're seeking an explanation for the Hubble tension, um, it's, you know, you're limited in, I think you're pretty limited in what you can actually do. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, people have uh, uh, been speculating about, you know, some uh, intermediate dark energy components, an early dark energy component that becomes important just at the time of recombination. Okay. And, uh, and so that, that's, uh, you know, highly, tuned to um, you know evade problems in the early universe and the, the late universe uh, but but it has and there's a controversial issue of whether these types of early dark energy models work at all um, because of uh, uh, constraints from uh, from galaxy clustering measured in uh, redshift surveys so you're limited in what you can do Okay, so I think in that sort of situation, it's then reasonable to question the accuracy of the distance ladder. Um, so is there really a problem um, or is, it, is there a, uh, an error lurking somewhere um, in the direct distance ladder measurements of the Hubble constant? So, um, So this, this, you know, for, for those of you that don't know very much, of, uh, you know, sort of traditional astronomy, this, uh, you know, I'll try and keep this simple. Measuring distances to objects um, in the universe to distant objects is difficult. And you have to bootstrap your way to, um, you know, to the far distant universe. So the way that this is done is that you, use geometrical measurements. So for example, Milky Way parallax measurements 
of which there are only a handful of good parallax measurements. The, um, the Gaia satellite will eventually give accurate parallax measurements to, to more uh, objects. But at the moment, we have about sort of 15 or so Cepheids <coughs> in the Milky Way. This might go up to about 50 with Gaia. Um, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, there's been uh, uh, a lot of work done on using detached eclipsing binaries. So there are 20 of these systems that have been <coughs> studied, and they give you a consistent geometric and accurate geometrical distance to the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, it, the uh, M31, it doesn't work so well. There are only three detached eclipsing binaries and they're not as consistent. So there's a, uh, a controversial geometric distance to Andromeda. And then the other important calibrator is NGC 4258, which has a, 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 a decretion disk um, and you can map at its center and you can map the dynamics of the accretion disk using very long baseline interferometry uh, using water maze lines. So this is uh, a very special nearby uh, amazing galaxy. So these are geometrical measurements. And so you, uh, so what you do is you look at uh, some uh, standard thing that you think is a standard candle like Cepheids in these systems and then measure Cepheids <coughs> in more distant galaxies that hosted type 1a supernovae and then uh, the nearby anchors and these Cepheids give you an absolute calibration of the peak magnitude of type 1a supernovae which you can then match to the magnitude redshift relation of distant supernovae, and that gives you the Hubble constant. Okay, you can't get the Hubble constant directly from uh, the, the supernovae in these systems, because uh, or, or or the Cepheids, because these are so nearby that they're affected by peculiar motions. So that's the that's the chain, and if somewhere in this chain you've made a photometric error of delta m magnitudes, then it will cause a perturbation to the Hubble constant given by this simple formula. So to actually uh, change the Hubble constant by 10%, there needs to be a systematic error of around 0.1 to 0.2 magnitudes somewhere in this chain. So you know, if there's something wrong, we're looking for an effect of that order. So, um, so here is uh, what Adam Rees and his collaborators do. Uh, they, def they use uh, Hubble Space Telescope near infrared magnitude. So that's what the H is, it's H bands, so it's 1.6 microns. Um, and then um, this color correction corrects the H band magnitudes for internal reddening of the galaxies. So for dust, and then you fit this to, um, you know, to uh, a model where P is the period of the Cepheid, B is the slope of this relation, and then a little correction based that uh, uh, quantifies the metallicity dependence of this uh, relation, and O over H is uh, a nebula metallicity. Uh, determined from H2 regions near to the supernova, to the Cepheids. So you fit a relation like this to uh, to Cepheids measured in nearby hosts of type 1a supernovae. And so if you do this, this is from analysis that I did. Um, these are residuals with respect to the best global fit. Determine these parameters and these are the, rela these are the residuals. Um, and um, you can see, so a couple of interesting things about this. The, the first is that the, the magnitudes of individual Cepheids are very poorly determined. You can see that the error bars here are half a magnitude or so. 
Okay, and this I think is very dangerous that the the uh, uh, individual magnitudes uh, are poorly determined, and the question is: Is there a systematic offset of you know one tick mark would resolve the Hubble tension? Okay, um, so you know in uh, so the dangerous part of this assumption is to to use the uh, a large number of very poorly determined magnitudes um, to beat the error down. Okay, so why are the errors so so uh, so big? Uh, well, these galaxies uh, are nearby galaxies. Uh, they're, they're typically you know between you know seven and fifteen megaparsecs away. Uh, but even for such nearby galaxies. At the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, every Cepheid is highly blended. So if we look at, these are just two examples. So here's the little, little postage stamp from an H-band image, okay, for this galaxy, NGC 3370, shown here, and for NGC 1309. And you can see that, that there are many, many objects here. And so what you have to do is you have to fit uh, for many objects and de-blend. In fact, that is the position of the Cepheid, um, you know, in, you know for, for this patch. And then these are blends. And then you subtract out uh, the uh, neighboring images and that gives you the magnitude of the Cepheid. And then this is the residual uh, after you've, you've done that. So, so this uh, type of deep blending is um, uh, is is a is a difficult thing to do, um, and it's it's difficult because um, you have to define magnitudes with respect to a sky background, and when you have uh, crowded fields, it's difficult to get that sky background. So that's why the errors are so big per per magnitude per, per object. And uh, my concern is that there may be a systematic error when you do this. So is there any evidence for this? And I think uh, that there is. And I think that, the, that this next point is really serious. Um, so I said that uh, you start off with geometrical distance measurements to nearby galaxies. Um, so, if, you know, for those of you that are not familiar with this, this type of stuff, mu is the distance modulus, so, so it's the difference between the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude of, of an object, which is five times log distance. So this is basically five log distance, determined from detached eclipsing binaries for the LMC. This is what you get, and these measurements are beautifully consistent with each other from 20 systems. Uh, the geometric distance to the MESA galaxy is determined from um, the uh, model of the accretion disk. Um, and th this is what you get for the distance modulus. Okay, so those are the two anchor, primary anchor distances that we have for this type of work. Um, but what I can do is I can use the Cepheid measurements to go from the LMC to NGC 4258 and predict a, a distance modulus for NGC 4258. So it's very simple analysis. Here's the period, uh, period magnitude relation for NGC 4258, that's shown as the red symbols. This galaxy is 7.6 megaparsecs away. So the errors on the photometry are big. You have the crowding problems that I referred to earlier. And here's the Large Magellanic Cloud, Cepheids, these are beautifully resolved because the LMC is so near. Um, and what you get is a distance modulus that's discrepant from uh, the MESA modulus uh, by three and a half sigma. So that's a shift equivalent to a shift of 0.18 magnitudes. So there is a problem right at the beginning of the distance ladder. Um, and so you can see this when you start doing solutions using all of the Cepheid data available, you can start seeing this 
Um, so here's the Hubble constant you get using Large Magellanic Cloud and using NGC 4258 as distance anchors. This is the slope of the Cepheid period luminosity relation. This band here is the one and two sigma errors from Planck. Um, and this incidentally is the slope that you get from uh, Cepheids in Andromeda. Uh, and what you see is that this is, is you know, th these are very, very different, okay? Even though almost all of the data that is the same, okay, between these two measurements. And the primary reason for the shift in the Hubble constant is the difference in this tension between uh, the distance moduli using Cepheids. And so if you add in uh, the, uh, if you add the two together, um, you get the gray contours, and this is the four sigma discrepancy of the Hubble tension. So it's not brilliantly consistent. And you can see this uh, because, you know, when you combine these two distance anchors, then the solution is going to try and share the, the, the tension, the pain between uh, the uh, distance moduli um, between the two anchors. And so that's what you get. Okay, um, so this distance modulus of the LMC and NGC 4258. And here's where, th um, where the experimental measurements sit. So they sit sort of three sigma away, okay. So, um, so what might be going on? So here is a simple model um, where I assume that the Hubble Space Telescope magnitudes are biased in some, some way by a constant delta ray. And in this type of model, um, the, the offset term will cancel if you use NGC 4258 as a distance anchor. Um, but it won't cancel if you use resolved calibrators like the LMC, the Milky Way, or M31. Okay, on, on this model, um, this is completely degenerate and will just cancel. Okay, and that's what I call the shoes degeneracy. Shoes is the name uh, that's uh, given to Adam Reese's uh, program. So here's a, an, an illustration of this. So this is like the analysis that Reset Al do, uh, NGC4258 as an anchor, the LMC, and then this offset is a measure of the tension between them. And then adding in the Milky Way um, parallax measurements, that's what you get. Okay, so that's the standard analysis. But now if I allow an offset, then, uh, then this is what you get you get no change whatsoever in the value of the Hubble constant because, uh, because uh, the, um, if you have an offset between ground-based resolved photometry and HST photometry, then nearby anchors tell you nothing about the Hubble constant. You'll always just get the value of uh, the NGC 4258 distance anchor. So all that happens is that things move around the slope changes, the best fitting slope, changes, but the value of the Hubble constant um, it doesn't. So that's problematic. So, you know, and uh, this shows you the solutions for, for that offset for those two cases. Okay, so, so there's, you know, 0.15 magnitudes uh, offset. Okay, so is there any evidence for something like this? And, and now, um, I want to look at um, an alternative uh, distance ladder uh, based on the tip of the red giant branch. In fact, uh, the distance moduli that you get from the tip of the red giant branch, uh, they track the distance moduli that you get for Cepheids for galaxies that are in common. So that's shown here, okay? So this is the difference in distance moduli between the two techniques, okay, shown by the red points if we use NGC4258 as the anchor for the Cepheids, and then the blue, the blue points if I use 
the LMC is the anchor for the Cepheids. The anchor for the, the tip of the red giant branch is always the LMC here. Um, and so what you can see is uh, a very big difference, okay? And so the tip of the red giant branch um, distance moduli differ from the Cepheid distance moduli uh, by 0.14 magnitudes. And it's a seven sigma effect. That's the offset on the blue line. So for the same anchor, namely the LMC, uh, the, there is a big offset and they're not consistent. So this is shown in another way here, okay? So um, here is the tip of the red giant branch. And in this case, what I've done is I've used exactly the same supernova data. Okay, for, for both tip of the red giant branch and Cepheids. Um, so uh, using the LMC anchor, you get a value of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But if you use Cepheids, you get a value of 76. So these are, these are discrepant. If you use NGC4258 as an anchor, then uh, these are reasonably close together. Okay. So the, the difference between uh, the, this measurement and this measurement is calibration. So it's a calibration problem. Okay. And this measurement is consistent with the CMB. Um, so, um, so how can we make progress? Well, here is the distance modulus of NGC4258. So, you know, um, here is the maser distance. Uh, this is what I determine using the Cepheids, which is discrepant. Um, then very recently, the Friedman and Al group has used uh, um, the tip of the red giant branch to get a distance modulus to NGC4258, and this is what they get. And in fact, in this paper, these authors use Myra variables to get a distance to NGC4258 uh, via the LMC. Um, and you see, these are, these are consistent with each other and offset. So there's no indication that, that this measurement, the VLBI measurement, is wrong, okay? There seems to be a problem with this determination, which relies on the Cepheids. So this is the, you know, the summary of the second part of the talk. Um, the, the differences in the distance ladder measurements of H0, differences between the Chicago group and uh, the Reese group, are primarily caused by differences in local calibration. And there's an inconsistency in the local calibrators that the Reese group use, okay? Um, and um, and so, so th this is quite, a, I mean, I think this is quite an important conclusion because, you know, there's been a, a Hubble tension in cosmology, you know, from the very first days when, um, you know, Hubble, determine the expansion of the universe and measure the Hubble constant. It's a difficult thing to do. So we've had a, a Hubble tension on and off in cosmology for nearly 100 years. And I was really concerned that, um, that it may take a long, long time to resolve this problem. Um, but because I think it's very clear that it's a, a, a calibration issue, then there is reasonable prospect of resolving this problem on a short time scale. Um, I think there are definitely inconsistencies with the di distance scale measurements that need to be investigated. Um, and, uh, and it should be possible to do this definitively on a relatively short time scale. And then we will know, I think, whether the Hubble tension really exists. Okay, and that's. Uh, that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, George, for the very nice talk. Very insightful. So uh, we have one question from Juan. Juan, did you want to ask your question or should I read it from the chat? Yeah, I, I can ask my, the question myself. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks, George. Beautiful talk indeed. 
So my question is very simple. Do you think the H0 tension will be restored before we have enough standard sirens, that is gravitational waves plus electromagnetic counterparts from binary to star events or dark sirens, so including logical structure and black holes rather than neutral stars? Yes. Uh, yes. Before, yeah. I mean, in order to get to similar accuracy as the, the Planck yeah. accuracy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so part of the reason for, for my optimism that this should be resolvable on a short time scale. Short meaning two years? Two years. Or... Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Right. You know? um, uh, so there, there, are, there are definite measurements that you can, you can make, you know, uh, you can target uh, new observations as well. Okay. That are not particularly difficult observations. Mm. Um, and the reason, so the reason I'm optimistic is because the discrepancy is 10%. Yeah. It's a large discrepancy. A lot. And if, if it's, you know, if, and the argument that I'm making is that uh, this is almost all in, in calibration. Okay. It's not supernovae. It's not, you know, um, yeah, it's not, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a problem with calibration. Um, and, um, and so, so, you know, you don't have to approach the sort of 2% precision that takes a long time with these distance ladders to check a 10% effect, okay? So, so uh, a few targeted observations. Let me give you an, an example. Do you think Gaia will make a, a difference? No, 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 not on this. That's too, early, too close. This, this, no, 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 no. This yeah. is at the heart of, of, of you know, on, you know, uh, it, you see, if the problem, the, the, what I'm arguing is, I think there is evidence that there is a problem with the crowded field photometry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if that is the, and it's almost sort of Sherlock Holmes like, you know, because by process of elimination, this is the only thing that's left, okay, that could be really wrong, okay? So it, the problem has to be there. And if that's where the problem is, it doesn't matter how accurately you, you, you how many Cepheids, you know, in the galaxy, how many planets measurements you get, how accurate they are. Mm -hmm. If the problem is between ground-based photometry and crowded field HST photometry, it won't help you. Yeah. You see, that's why, that's why, you know, when I showed you that thing about the H0 constraints, you know, if I allow an offset, adding in the LMC, adding in, mm -hmm the Milky Way, you know, it doesn't help you. You always get the same answer, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, so no, the, the, what you need to do is to, to um, so two, two important things are to, um, to look at NGC 4258 again, both the VLBI distance measurements, because it's a complicated analysis, so that needs to be done. Uh, and then to get uh, Cepheids at larger distances in NGC 4258. In fact, although it's, the, the, you know, uh, the second nearest galaxy that the Reese group have looked at for Cepheids and made measurements of Cepheids, uh, it's the, the they, they've focused on the central regions. A lot of the data is on the central region, so it's very crowded. Very crowded, yeah. So, so if they if they get Cepheid measurements of more distant, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Cepheids, that would be useful. And then for the uh, Chicago group, uh, I mean, Gaia would help with um, getting using being able to use globular clusters as calibrators of the tip of the red giant branch. That would be a good thing. But then the other thing that I think could be done better is. Um, uh, an analysis of a better analysis of extinction in the Large Magellanic Cloud. So there are a number of relatively straightforward things that can be done. Okay, on a short time scale. Good luck. <laughs> okay, there is a question in the chat from Vilmar Cardona. He says, "When will we have accurate uh, Milky Way Cepheid parallaxes, and how many will we expect from Gaia?" Uh, right. Okay. So the the uh, uh, so the issue is um, so it's the astronomy getting the uh, 
an astrometric reference frame from Gaia that is accurate for bright objects. And, you know, with the, the data release too, uh, there was an offset between bright and faint objects. And that made, um, th th you know, that, that offset um, did not allow you to get, um, ba basically, if you did an analysis uh, comparing, uh, you know, Gaia parallaxes with um, HST and Hipparchos parallaxes, all you did was determine the offset, okay? So that offset will go down as you get more and more data scanned in, you know, scanned in different orientations, okay? That, that will, that offset will go down. Um, but it's not a sort of panacea because um, the, the there, for, for these uh, distant galaxies, I mean, you know, the, the, the ones that host type 1a supernovae, um, almost all of the uh, periods, the, the, all, almost all of the cephids are long period cephids, right, with periods of greater than 20 days, okay? And um, there aren't that many uh, Milky Way cephids th with long periods. Um, for which you can get accurate parallaxes. So the numbers will go up to about 50 or 60, okay? You'll get 50 or 60 parallaxes. Um, and then lots of parallaxes for short period cepheids, which are much more abundant, but they don't help you with this problem. Okay, thank you. And Alvaro wants to make a question. Alvaro, are you there? Yeah, I want to uh, make a comment and ask a question. The comment is concerning your conclusion about the Hubble tension. As you said, there has been a Hubble tension almost continuously uh, for the past 100 years. Yeah. Now that's the livelihood and the entertainment of uh, traditional ast uh, astronomers. You cannot take it away from them, poor people. <laughs> <laughs> now my question, also looking for trouble, in something is the following. You mentioned en passant um, nuclear synthesis. Yes. Do you have something to say about lithium-7? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, the, the uh, uh, so, you know, I mean that, um, the interest in that cross section was because it was an important contributor to the error budget for deuterium. But the lithium seven problem is still there. Okay, thanks. Beautiful talk, by the way. Well, thank you. Okay, so uh, Jordi Miralda has raised their hand. Can you, Jordi, are you, can you ask? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, George. So uh, I wanted to ask you if, if the reason for this discrepancy in the end is this, um, uh, problem with uh, photometry in crowded fields with uh, HST, uh, don't we have other ways to test this with other variable stars? For example, you could look at globular clusters and look at uh, RR Lyris or something else to see if there is some similar effect. Uh, okay, so, so, uh, so yes, I mean, yes, the, the uh, uh, you know, I mean, another thing that you could do is, um, uh, you know, take photometry of well-resolved uh, systems. I mean, like Andromeda, and degrade the resolution to mimic uh, HST images. Okay. The the um, so so yes, you could. You know, there, there's been some limited amount of work that's been done along along those lines. Um, so. You know, I mean, the, the 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 way that this varying sky background is dealt with is by injecting fake stars into the images, um, and then um, and then determining a crowding correction by Monte Carlo. And the thing that would bother you or bother me about something like that is uh, is you know whether um, you know, cepheids are, you know, entirely 
random, you know, whether this sort of random injection um, is appropriate for Cepheids or whether they're, you know, correlated with other stars, binaries and, and little groups and so on. And so that you can, you could try degrading well-resolved images and looking at that. And, and Reese et al have done a, uh, some of that. Um, so yes, so I think there are ways of, uh, of looking at it. I, I'd also worry at a more fundamental level of um, the, the, the way that the, uh, you know, deep blending is quite difficult to do. And, you know, whether the, the, there are intrinsic problems in the way that the deep blending is done that lead to biases. So aside from sky background, so, so just the application of deep blending algorithms. It'd be nice to, to you know, to, to have an independent analysis of the photometry you know, by a group using different different software, different techniques. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, there is one question by Guillermo. Guillermo, are you there? Yes, uh, hello. So the question is the following. I think there is another way that people mention about um, measuring H0, which is a uh, measuring the, the time delays in lens images of quasars, right? This is the Holy Cow collaboration, mm -hmm. which has this funny name. And mm -hmm. this one gives a, a measurement that is also large compared to the CMB. And I suppose this cannot be explained away with a kind of shift, uh, systematic shift that you are referring uh, that could be yes. happening with that, CFH, right? Yes, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, but it doesn't it doesn't give uh, a large value of H naught. That's the problem. Um, sorry. Let, so his I've anticipated somebody might ask this question. Uh, so the the upper figure this figure is um, is from the Holy Cow paper analyzing six uh, strongly lensed systems and their time delays, and this is the value of H naught that that they determined. Okay, so this looks looks uh, in tension with the the Planck value. Now, uh, I'm sure you know you, you, an expert on this, you know, so he might want to comment. But uh, uh, there may be other experts in the audience. Um, so, at the end of every uh, time delay talk, I would ask the question: What about uh, the mass sheet degeneracy? Because um, it's you know a, 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 some uh, you know a mass sheet doesn't alter the lensing system, but it will change your distances and it, it'll uh, it's degenerate with the value of H naught that you determine. Now, in the Holy Cow analysis, they adopted uh, a very specific form for the profiles of the uh, of the lensing galaxies. And um, add computed a, 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 an external convergence, you know, from fluctuations along the line of sight by counting galaxies and then uh, looking at numerical simulations and then trying to estimate a distribution of external convergences uh, from the simulation. So that's folded in. Um, but you can also, I mean, I think it's you know useful in this problem to separate out. Um, the additional convergence uh, to a far field thing, which is, you know, sort of partially taken into account in this analysis, with a more local uh, mass sheet degeneracy, and that's what's been done in this paper by Birrer et al. Okay, where they have made um, uh, a model. Um, so it's it's. Uh, a model that um, allows um, modifications to the profiles of galaxies in a way that keeps the uh, lensing uh, positions and magnitudes the same, um, but it changes the value of H. So it's like having a sort of local mass sheet degeneracy. And 
uh, then the, the, the only way that you can really constrain this is by having additional spectroscopic data. So these are results from their paper. So, so this paper you know, has the authors of uh, the Holy Cow collaboration. It's all part of the, you know, a, a, a bit bigger team than the Holy Cow's collaboration. But they've done this and they've, they've uh, used uh, lenses plus uh, different types of kinematic constraints, either coming from um, SDSS spectroscopy, Sloan Digital Sky Survey spectroscopy, or um, special purpose integral field uh, spectroscopy, uh, for strong lenses from this survey, the SLAX survey. And what they've done is they've combined the SLAX survey data with these, these data um, on the assumption that these objects are representative of the lens, strong lenses in the holy cow sample. Uh, and then, so this is basically what, what happens if you um, use different spectroscopic data. And you can see that, that you know, the numbers shift around. The most important thing is, the most important thing to get from this is that the error is big. It's plus or minus six kilometers per second. And uh, even when you add spectroscopic data, it doesn't shrink by very much. So, so this error is not reflecting the error from more flexible mass profile models of the lens galaxies. Okay. And then the central value depends on what external constraints you apply to the holy cow sample. Okay. So, so, and I think that this is completely fair analysis. The strong lensing, um, you have enough flexibility in the mass modeling that these, this error is a real underestimate of the errors. Okay. So I don't know if Jordi wants to, to, to comment. Thank you. Uh, I'm not Jordi, I'm Guillermo, but thank you for the answer. Uh, any more questions, comments? Okay, if there are no more questions or comments, then we can thank uh, George again. Thank you again, George, for the very nice talk. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.